Good evening. Hello and welcome, everyone. Welcome to tonight's session. Um, it's lovely to see so many of you here joining us on our Tesla Dialogue session for tonight. Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome. Great to see you all. Welcome, Erva, Jessica, Hi. Mitra, Bernana. Hi, Jennifer, Elizabeth, Shona, Amandeep, Natalie, Maha. That's great. So many of you here. Uh, Elizabeth, um, who else? Alia, Nasreen, Mahmoud, Hallie, Domenica. Hello, everybody. Good evening and welcome to tonight's session. Together with me tonight, we I have uh, Elizabeth and David, who are our moderators from Tesla Dialect team, and our lovely subject matter expert, Saskia Van Vegan, joining us tonight. So without further ado, um, let's start our session for tonight. Elizabeth, if we could start with some housekeeping rules first. Thank you. We do really hope you enjoyed tonight's dialogue. So um, the topic for tonight is stepping into classroom-based research. Our presenter is Dr. Saskia Van Vegan from York University. Thank you for joining us tonight, Saskia. It's a pleasure to have you with us. I'm delighted to be here. Perfect. So as usual, in our TESOL dialogue sessions, we do pose some questions to our subject matter expert, and then the floor is open to all our members. But before we start, let's go through uh, Dr. Van Vegan's experience. She is an associate professor and English as a second language coordinator in the Department of Languages, Literatures and Linguistics at York University in Toronto, Canada. Her research engages with bi and multilingualism in education, language assessment, and language teaching and learning in post-secondary contexts. She co-edited the book, Plurilingual Pedagogies, Critical and Creative Underta Undertakings for Equitable Language in Education, Lau and Van Vegan 2020. And she's also editor-in-chief of the International Journal Critical Inquiry in Language Studies. It's great to have Saskia with us tonight. So without further ado, let's start with tonight's agenda. As usual, we'll have introductory questions in which we introduce the topic in question for tonight. Then we'll continue with a couple of conversation and discussion questions, and we'll end our dialogue session with our breakout room activity that you all love participating in. So our first question for tonight is Saskia and everybody else in turns, could you tell us something about your background in classroom-based research? Over to you, Saskia. Thank you so much, Loretta. Um, myself as a professor, um, we all engage in different methodological approaches and a core aspect of my research is engaging in research practice partnership with educators. Um, these are teachers, practicing teachers who in their classrooms work together with me, uh, engaged in something called collaborative inquiry to uh, explore issues and challenges, um, whether these be arising from theory or whether they come from classroom issues. And it's, been an approach that I have used since doing my PhD studies. Um, I guess I finished in 2013. So uh, yeah, at least over the last 10 to 12 years. Um, I've done a variety of different projects looking at everything from plurilingual pedagogies to multilingual assessment um, to um, academic socialization of students at the post-secondary level. And when engaging in this work with educators, it's often my job to um, create the research design. And this is where I draw upon uh, the methodological skills and training that I learned during my doctoral research to craft the design of a study, um, 
determine data collection tools or instruments, obtain um, consent from my institutional ethics board and also the institutional ethics boards of school districts or schools where I'm conducting research, and then um, recruiting teachers to engage in this work with me. And it's at that point where we start the, the ongoing collaboration where um, teachers and I work together to document various aspects of student learning, of pedagogic innovations and their impact, um, or very different, different aspects of student assessment uh, and other kinds of pedagogic uh, interventions. So we gather these data together and then reflect on these data as well. So usually my job as a university-based researcher, I synthesize the data that teachers have shared with me and I do some preliminary analysis and then share it back with them um, to engage in some collaborative data analysis. And so that's, that's my background in classroom-based research. So it means I'm working side by side with teachers in their classrooms often. And it's something I, I very much enjoy. It really depends on relationships with teachers for me. Um, and what is amazing about it is I get to learn from their classroom-based expertise. Because for myself as a university-based researcher, I'm not in classrooms all the time. I'm only there when invited by a teacher. So, so for me, it's a real honor and something I, I respect very much that they open their classroom to me. Um, but in that sense, I kind of um, guide and facilitate their classroom-based research. And so that's part of what brings me here today is to talk a little bit about uh, how we can draw on those kinds of insights in the context of TESOL classrooms um, and ESL classrooms to do the same kind of work within our broader TESOL Ontario community. And, and as part of the uh, research advisory committee of the organization, one of our aims is to build capacity to engage in research among our membership. So I'm here to um, hopefully plant some seeds, generate some curiosities, and facilitate inspiration and encourage our members to engage in classroom-based research. That's great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Saskia, for uh, introducing us to the work you do and to the vision that TESO Dialogue has for its members and for all our teachers and, and the work they do with their students. Um, so it's really important that our students learn what happens um, during and after the research conducted in their own classrooms. And it's great to see that they have an invitation to participate in research themselves. And, and that's the question we have now for, for all of our members here tonight. So do you have any experience with classroom-based research, be that as a researcher yourself or also as a participant in a research? We would love to hear from you and the stories you have. Um, so as usual, please feel free to raise your hand and use your microphone or type in the chat box. Anyone that does have an experience related to classroom research? Do we have anyone here? Or maybe that's why you're here, right? <laughs> We're here to learn more maybe, right? Okay. Take your time to write in the chat, maybe, and we'll uh, David will make sure we'll read them out. Yes, over to you, David. Uh, so I'm just going, trying to encourage people to uh, either, if you, you don't want to speak out, you can write something in the chat and we can relay that for you, or you can raise your hands and uh, Elizabeth will let us know that uh, what order people have put up their hands and what uh, people want Perfect. to say. I can see Jennifer saying that Jennifer has participated in a research for literacy learners. That's amazing. That's great. So yes, Jennifer, you do have a hands-on experience with research. That's great. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, very good. So I guess 
other participants are here to, to learn more. So maybe it's time for us to move on to our second question, Elizabeth. Okay, so our second question is, what does collaboration with teachers look like in research practice? Now, Saskia will share her side of the story and her side of the collaboration. And again, if you reflect back and find instances in which you have been the teacher collaborating with researchers, we would love to hear that too. So Saskia, you can, you can share your experience with teachers. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. Um, one of the key things about doing uh, research inquiry, classroom-based research, is not feeling like you're alone. Um, it's great to be able to work with colleagues, um, administrators, university-based researchers, and even with students to engage in a process of collaborative inquiry. I really feel that uh, when we share interpretations that we have, from our classroom with our colleagues, it's like a process of peer review where we have an opportunity to share insights, um, generate ideas together, identify patterns um, with the help of our community of practice in our schools or perhaps uh, outside of our schools with, the, with another um, professional group such as colleagues from Tesla, Ontario. Um, in doing this, engaging with, with fellow teachers in looking at evidence from the classroom and, and solving research questions, this really sees teachers as knowledge generators. And so this collaboration is not just a strategy, but it's a mindset that teachers can generate educational research by selecting their own inquiry questions, gathering evidence from their classrooms, analyzing these data, um, and then deriving theory or generating theory based on what they see. Um, I would call that theorizing from practice. We often hear about this, um, about the connection between research and practice, or sometimes you hear it described as a disconnection or a, a gap between research and practice. The way we bridge that is by, at least through classroom-based research and what makes classroom-based research so, so special is that we are able to um, generate theory from the patterns that emerge in, in what we see in our own classroom. And it's, so the collaboration piece um, looks like talking to colleagues. It looks like gathering evidence of student learning, showing it to colleagues and discussing it together and saying, hey, I see this, do you see that too? Um, and what do you notice about um, this uh, student work? Um, and also being able to share observations. So sometimes when two teachers are looking at the same uh, activity in a classroom, or they're looking at the same piece of student learning, like artifact of student learning, each might see something different because we each bring our own lens. But broadly, um, this collaboration is, like I said, more than a strategy, it's a mindset, being open to generating knowledge together with our, our peers. And that's amazing to to hear explained here and also it, it's really um it's really beautiful to see that we start from what we see in the classroom and then we uh, turn it into a theory we learn from it and we share that knowledge with others so that um present as well as future generations of teachers uh, learn from those experiences that we observe in our classrooms that's great um, Mahmoud is sharing that um he engaged in an informal inquiry collective troubleshooting student engagement at York TESOL program back in 2019. Right. So anyone else have uh, anything they'd like to share? Please uh, be sure to post in the chat or raise your hand and we can ask call on you. Well, I think, Mahmoud, you at least participated in that, correct? Maybe... Uh, mm -hmm. Raise your hand and we can call on you. 
it might be interesting when we would I not to um not to tap Put you you on on the spot, water, but <laughs> but but to share what was that like to have that time and space to talk with colleagues about um student engagement together. Oh well, that was really a good experience. I'm, I'm not sure. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Am, am I am I audible? Yep. Okay. Uh, I believe uh, Saskia, uh, we we had uh, a regular meeting. Uh, one was uh, a monthly meeting during the 2019-2020. And uh, then uh, you initiated a project for collaboration among teachers in, in order to uh, see what our students actually need in order to promote our program in Tessel at Stroke University. Uh, at the time, we collectively met, I guess, uh, three times. We started to initiate a framework. The framework is uh, first by brainstorming what are the students' uh, needs uh, from our perspectives as teachers. Uh, you know, the things we face in the classroom, you know, like uh, motivation uh, from the students' part, uh, if the students uh, are really engaged with the reading issues that we share with them. Uh, that's uh, content-wise uh, uh, focused, and then uh, what uh, tools or strategies we, we were using at the time. Um, uh, I believe that we collectively uh, shared uh, a Google Doc in which each one participated uh, uh, with his or her uh, piece, and then we gathered all of this and started to initiate a step-by-step -step process. I believe that we're we're going to talk about this process uh, and maybe in uh, the following two steps or two questions. So I'll leave the floor for you. Yeah, you picked up some key words that we'll come back to later. Um, so I heard you mention about the collaborative piece, the documentation, having a systematic process, uh, and then choosing a focus, choosing an inquiry uh, that was shared. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's very uh, interesting to hear, actually, that we do have um, a member who has participated in a um, in a typical research. Um, Jennifer, as well, is sharing that Saskia's perspective is very interesting. My experience was unfortunately the last collaborative. Well, that happens, right? Uh, the researchers were very nice, but didn't engage with the teachers or learners they observed. Mm -hmm. It was a bit off-putting at first, but I eventually got used to it. I always wondered what the outcome was and think it would have been good to receive a copy of their findings. Yes, right? And that's, um, that's what I really liked, what Saskia was sharing, that teachers are collaborators, they are part, and they should know, right, the, the findings of the research. They should know what happened after the research and, and get a copy of it. So absolutely, Jennifer, that's, um, that's great to share um, your interest and concern here for sure. Saskia, is that a typical procedure you have? So getting back to you, do you always share the copy of the findings or are these privacy matters? What happens? Yeah, well, generally the teachers are part of selecting the key findings. Mm. So or we, we call it a process of member checking where we go back to the teachers and we show them what we have learned from them. And we ask for them to, to check mm -hmm. if we were correct in our interpretations. And that gives them an opportunity to correct anything or add anything. Um, and I found that process really valuable because I think what Jennifer is describing is an experience more where the teacher's classroom is an object of, of research and a teacher is kind of like an object of somebody else's research. But when you do classroom-based research, collaborative inquiry, action research, the teacher is the subject. The teacher is driving the inquiry because it comes from their questions and their concerns. And so the teacher owns that research more. Um, and so the other piece is, again, I've done it in collaboration with teachers, but what I'm hoping to 
send a message about today is that you can do this on your own. You don't need university-based researchers to work with you. You can be a teacher researcher and generate theory based on uh, your classroom experience. I also just wanna add too that I think this is important more than ever right now to generate theory from our current classrooms because so much in the teaching and learning landscape has changed over the last five years. Um, the context of the pandemic, uh, digital resources, open AI, um, changes in global migration patterns. Our classrooms look different now than they looked previously. And so it's important to have up-to-date perspectives. So how do you do that? We can wait until research, university-based researchers publish articles. They'll be published eventually, but we need, sometimes we need answers now. So how do you, how do you do research in your own classroom based on that? Nice. That that's very inspiring and encouraging, indeed. So I really hope we, um, our teachers tonight and professors um, that are that have joined us tonight, have a chance to learn more about how they can initiate such a research and be the researchers in their own classroom. Great. So um, it's the perfect timing to move on to our conversation and discussion questions. So we'll start with our very first one, and. Um, so the first one is, what are the core principles of classroom-based or action research? So let's start from the root. Uh, what are these core principles that our uh, members need to, to know and learn about? Sure, absolutely. Well, um, a very basic way of thinking about classroom-based research is in a spiral of inquiry. So a spiral um, going up and up and up. Um, that doesn't end, doesn't stop, doesn't end. Um, and along this spiral, we have three key verbs. Uh, that's the easiest way to describe it. And these are um, observe, well, sorry, there, there are four. Act, observe, reflect, and plan. And I, I can put those in the chat too. Well, you could, they, I guess technically they start. We can write them for you, Saskia. That's fine. Yeah, plan, act, observe, and reflect. So okay. these four verbs, it just keeps going in a circle. And it, it really follows the instructional cycle as well, where we start by planning a lesson. We act by implementing the lesson. And then we observe what has happened. We observe generally by um, gathering artifacts of student learning. We um, observe how our students respond. We observe how they uh, take up what we have taught them. Um, we observe their writing, their speaking, um, and so on. And then we reflect on our observations. And this is a continuous cycle. And then based on the reflections, we plan again and the cycle begins all over again. So this cycle of um, action research, this spiral of action research, it's iterative um, and the knowledge expands as you go along. So at the, at the core, at the very bottom of the spiral, for example, is your first question. So if your question is around say student engagement, and your question is, how can I improve student engagement in my classroom? You start with that question and then you plan uh, an approach to affecting student engagement. Um, then you act, you deliver, you implement that approach, you gather your observations of the effects, and then you reflect on your observations. Um, the key, another key point is when you are um, reflecting, this is kind of like a process of self-reflection and it's also a process of assessment in a way because we are assessing what we are observing, but without judgment. So we are um, trying to look at what the observations are telling us. And so these are some of the principles. Um, 
it's also really important to note that this work, when we choose an inquiry question to drive our, our research, we want that question to be relevant. Um, we want it to be reasoned as well. So when we when we engage in our analysis, that we, we use good reasoning. Um, we also want to be adaptive. We may need to adapt the question as we go through the spiral. We may see, oh, our original question was not a good question, or I can improve my question so you can adapt it. Um, and then of course, every aspect is informed by have, being a reflective practitioner. So having uh, an open to learning mindset and being willing to look at your own practice and see the student, the evidence of student learning as relating to your own practice. So seeing those, those things in dialogue. So I guess I'll, maybe I'll stop there with that plan. The main thing though, is the plan, act, observe, reflect and the spiral in terms of the core principles. That was very informative, Saskia, and uh, I'm sure many of our members now are thinking about their own practice and whether at some point um, they do it in their own classrooms, right? I was thinking the same thing, that um, we're always in this cycle of uh, planning activities, delivering them, um, observing our students' reaction, maybe reflecting and changing, right? Adapting um, all the activities we do and learn from what went wrong and what uh, really worked well and repeat doing that. So could, we are- Could I ask you, yes, sorry. Mm -hmm. Could I ask you, Saskia, mm -hmm. what, what's the threshold for coming up with a question like that? I mean, obviously we'll have be presented with things that we're gonna have to reflect upon as teachers like constantly and we couldn't, what, what would you recommend being the threshold of a uh, question for us if we were considering such inquiries ourselves? Mm, that is a really great question. And in fact, one of our colleagues on the uh, research advisory committee is hoping to do a presentation on how to develop mm. a research question. So I'll, I can't do as, as great a job as she is going to do. But um, a lot of times you want to start with a so-called, and I say so-called because I, I don't like using negative language, but a problem of practice, a so-called problem of practice. So often you want you want to start with something that's not working the way you had hoped um, or not working the way something is expected or a gap that um, you would like to fulfill. Um, by looking, by framing it as a problem of practice, um, it keeps us looking towards finding an answer and finding a solution. And it's really helpful to use a question like whether and how, whether, um, whether this is happening for students and if so, how. You can also frame the question uh, as an if then statement. If I do this, then my students will do that. Um, similarly, you could use when uh, to frame a question. So beyond after that, once you start the cycle of inquiry, then you'll soon start to see whether you are able to collect data to answer that question. I find sometimes when we make the question, our research question the first time, um, it might be an unanswerable question. It might be too big for what, what is possible to observe in my classroom. So that's okay. The next time we go around that cycle, we can narrow the question a little bit. You'll also notice that I've used a few synonyms, uh, research question, inquiry question, problem of practice. All of these are can be interchangeably used. Um, as a university-based researcher, I usually use the word research question. But when I'm thinking about practice, I often think about my own inquiry question. So that's, yeah, that's how I would frame it. Another good idea too, is to ask colleagues. So make your question and then ask someone what they think of that question. 
Oh, and you can develop the question with students. You can you can talk to your students and about something and say, I notice, uh, you know, in this class, we're struggling to um, perhaps complete our our um, digital productions well. So, do we have a question about why that's not working? and then make a question together. Sometimes students can be helpful in that way. And students often have their own questions. You can also do um, action research or classroom-based research with your students. So you turn it into a class project where everyone is, we make one question and then we're all gathering evidence to answer that question. Okay, thank you. So there's uh, some uh, comments here in the, uh, in the chat. Um... Mahmoud says, um, maybe we should try out new ways, like should we allow students to use ChatGBT and how? Uh, collaboration can be done at, diff uh, sorry, this is uh, Mitra. Uh, collaboration can be done at different levels with colleagues and students. Uh, Mahmoud's again, uh, what student wants, needs, and likes? A student analysis. Right, so these are great ideas. Um, so we invite students, as Mahmoud is saying, what is it that they need to see in their own classrooms? And they become members and we empower them as well. And they will become great collaborators in our research, for sure. They'll, they will understand why we're doing it and they will benefit at the end. So Mahmoud, that, that's a great idea. And, and yes, as Mitra says, collaboration. Um, uh, we can collaborate with our colleagues and uh, share ideas, concerns, research questions, and and ask for what's going on in their classroom. And I think that's a great opportunity to learn more um, and, and students for sure. Yes. And Mahmoud question on Chat GPT. I think that's a that can be turned into an interesting research question uh, in our in our classroom. Um, maybe narrowing it down. As Saskia was mentioning earlier, ChatGPT is really huge, but maybe um, if using ChatGPT for this particular assignment, um, can you, can students do better in this aspect of their writing or can students do back better in their presentation skills? Would that be a question that you could think? Yes, please. Oh, uh, well, um... Actually, this is a whole debate nowadays, uh, but uh, it's uh, a collaboration among teachers how to mm, control the students' use of chat. It's a fast slide. They are using that. So, how can we account that for plagiarism? Should we consider plagiarism or not? Uh, all of these questions are re really hard to debate nowadays among teachers, especially mm -hmm. in colleges. Um, but yeah, um, uh, the, to define that problem per se is a challenge. And from what uh, what purposes and uh, from whose perspective should we adapt it? Actually, in my classroom, I, I use this as, as a debate question among the students. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, should we allow you to use activity and why should we do that? And what can we see? Um, most students agree that uh, using ChatGPT to generate their writing pieces is, you know, of course, it's plagiarized. Um, whereas uh, using that to understand the research question there or the problem or a piece of writing as, or the assignment uh, instruction or to create an outline for their uh, piece, that might be feasible. So, again, this is still under discussion. I'm not sure if. Uh, any other colleges or you can share uh, your perspective from your colleges or your institutions. Um, that's what's happening in my college. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mahmoud. Yes, um, that's the question of the day, I think, of the year. <laughs> Chat GPT, right? And how and when and why and um, really where to use it. Um, okay, very good. So, once we have come up with these uh, research question, what do we do, right? And that's our next question. Uh, we'll talk about documentation. Um, so the next question, Elizabeth, if you could help me, is focused on what is the pedagogic documentation 
uh, that we can use in our classroom and why is it important for our research? Great, thank you. Um, so pedagogic documentation is, it can be described as gathering evidence of student learning. So you're documenting pedagogy, you're documenting student learning. Um, when we engage in pedagogic documentation, what we're doing is we're showing uh, what we have done along the journey. It's kind of like an audit trail of everything that um, has happened in doing the research. Documentation can be qualitative or quantitative. I will say the easiest way to start thinking about it is, again, with three things, um, observations, conversations, and artifacts. And I'll, I'll put that, or maybe if we can put that in the chat as well. So observations can include field notes that you take, uh, notes on your lessons, lesson plans that you keep. Um, it could be digital videos, recordings of student work in your classroom, recordings of students speaking, um, and even just observations that you don't write down can be part of your observations. Although um, I will say it's really hard to remember things you know, two weeks, two weeks later, sometimes when I'm doing um, writing my own field notes, if I don't have time to write them, I'll record a voice memo in my phone. And nowadays, of course, you can use voice to text transcription, automatic software. So that is another way to document your notes. So these are observations. The next is conversations. So you want to document conversations. These are student teacher conferences. You can record them. You can write notes about them. Um, they could be conversations that are written feedback to students and then um, students comments on that feedback or uh, students responses to your feedback. It might be interviews with students. Um, it can also be a survey of your students to gather their perceptions. The main thing about conversations is it really helps you to get student perceptions, perceptual data. Um, and then artifacts of student learning are any evidence of student learning from your classroom. So this is where I find my phone comes in very handy. Digital images of student work that you take uh, with their permission, obviously. Um, copies of their assessments, copies of tests, uh, copies of their writing that they have shared. Um, documentation of projects that they have completed. So it can be any evidence that your students have learned something. And it can also um, include, for example, student testimonials. So student reflections of their own learning, that would be more part of conversations, obviously. Um, some people call it conversation, sorry, observations, conversations and products of student learning. I say artifacts, but some people say products. Um, and then the key thing is when you're gathering this pedagogic documentation, you don't need to be analyzing it. You're just gathering it. And really, if you wanna follow the cycle, the spiral of inquiry, you would reflect at the end on the documentation that you have gathered. You don't want to gather documentation that you don't need because time is precious. Um, so you can make sure your documentation is focused on exactly the things responding to your question. So if it's a question about student writing, then you're only gathering documentation relating to student writing. Don't gather other documentation. I suggest if you like, if you want to be, Mahmoud said earlier about having a step-by-step -step process, being systematic. It is not a bad idea when you think about research design. And again, that's what I do as a university-based researcher. Design your research for that month. Set a start date and an end date. We have to do that at the university. We have to have a starting day and an ending day for the research. Um, it could You could do a month. You could do three months. Um, you could do six months. 
uh, a, a year, but have an end date by which you'll stop collecting data. That's the key. You want to stop collecting data when you reach this point of saturation, where if you keep collecting for one more month, you're not going to get anything new. That's when you know it's time to stop. For example, when we're doing interviews with students, um, if we're interviewing them and we're interviewing you know, eight students, 12 students, 16, 20 students, I'm sure by the time we get to uh, over 12 students, we'll start to hear a lot of the same comments. And so that means you can stop. It's enough. It means you should stop and analyze. Um, so anyway, have a timeline and in your systematic plan, write down in advance if you can, what data are you going to collect? So have a plan for yourself. I'm going to collect these three pieces of data and then you know what, what your research job is. You, you sort of have, have created a scope for your inquiry. And that's, you've created a design for your inquiry. You've created a step-by-step -step systematic plan. And then when you start the research, you're carrying out those steps. Okay, I've collected, you know, three pieces of student writing for every student in my class over the course of three months. I've interviewed each student once and I documented my teaching about writing twice. And that's my evidence. That's my pedagogic documentation. That's my data. You can use all those words synonymously as well. I'll stop there. So, um, Mahmoud has got um, the observation that many classes are recorded, especially if they are hybrid or online. The trick mm -hmm. is to acquire consent and ethics approval first. Um, mm -hmm. that, that's a good point. Now, um, teacher-based inquiry, classroom-based inquiry, teacher action research, we generally do not need ethics approval for. So ethics approval will come from an institutional body, a committee, who will approve your research process. But if you're not going to publish the research, if you're just uh, going to use that for your own practice, and I believe you, you can also present it for professional learning purposes, um, then you don't need an official ethics. But if you are in doubt, you can always ask your administrator if uh, ethics is required. Sometimes it's just permission. Um, that is required. And of course, even when ethics is not required, I encourage everyone to always treat our students as um, agents in the research process, ask for their permission, invite them to share, um, rather than just, um, you know, documenting it without their knowledge. So along those lines, Jennifer has asked, uh, is consent necessary? And you've answered that, but uh, she makes the point about um, personal or identifying information if it's not included. Is that uh, is that something that we need as long as we're not identifying the student? Does that? Yeah, again, this is a good anything? question and distinction between research for professional learning and research for um, publication purposes. When you are a university-based researcher and you're bound to the code of ethics of the of the tri-council and of your institution, you have to always do that. So I always have to do that because that's part of my affiliation, my university affiliation. But if your affiliation is um, with a local community-based organization, there is pro there may not be an ethical review process. But that's what you need to do is inquire uh, if there is an ethical review process and then follow what that process is. But for your own professional learning, uh, you can document student learning and gather it for yourself with students' names on it. But yes, if you're going to share it, I would say um, professional practice would would dictate that you don't um, share identifying information about students. But you're making me think, Jennifer, that TESA Ontario might need um, a guide. Maybe our research advisory committee could come up with a, guide, a set of guidelines for 
for doing classroom-based research to answer these questions because a lot of people have that question. That is absolutely what I was thinking, a guide on ethics, but also Bravo, on all the steps required, right? <laughs> Yeah. Well, Jennifer, um, we may be volunteers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, Mahmoud's made the point that portfolios can be one of the ways to document. Mm -hmm. Do you have comments on that or Saskia? Oh. Mahmoud, either Mahmoud. of you have comments on that? Yeah. Well, um, if it is me, then uh, uh, portfolios nowadays is featuring uh, uh, strategy. Um, some courses may require portfolios building up from course till the end of the course and that's a proof of progress from uh, for the students part and uh, it is a way to grade our students uh, progress as well but that document itself is a, a rich um, data that we can analyze and uh, see how how we can really address the students needs based on their progress uh, was it slow is it regressed uh, what are the obstacles um, again, depends on how many assignments that they are doing. Um, but it is a way of teaching, and uh, why not uh, use it as a, um, a research tool as well? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, so Nani is commenting here. Uh, maybe Nani can speak mm. up about uh, P PBLA. PBLA, right? Right, yeah. so Naina is saying PBLA can be a good example of a portfolio now. Avenue has a digital way of uploading artifacts. That's amazing. Great. So yeah, the tools yeah. are there. The tools are there. That's great. But yes, a guide would definitely help um, everybody who's interested in all the steps, documentation and procedures. Amazing. So our roundtable today is a great way to start right our conversation our dialogue session today is a great way to get started and um get thinking about this okay so i think it's perfect now to talk about our next question to saskia which is how can teachers decide what methods what research methods or techniques um are the right ones are the right fit for them and their students yeah, this, this is a great question. Um, I think what's really important is to decide what you feel comfortable with. Um, again, with qualitative data, quantitative data, um, student interviews, surveys, gathering artifacts. I think you want to start with something that feels feasible for you. Time is also a big issue. So you want to keep in mind that you, you choose something that you're going to be able to finish because you want to feel successful about it. Um, the other important thing is when you choose which data collection method, and again, that can that's synonymous with pedagogical documentation and so on, um, you want to choose something that can help you answer the question that you have. So, recognize what is the difference between an inside perspective and an outside perspective, an emic and an edic perspective. So if you do a survey or if you ask interview questions or have a student teacher conference, you can get student perceptual data. You can get students views about something. But if you just uh, gather uh, writing samples from a, a writing task, you're not going to know how students felt about that writing task. So if you want to know their feelings about it, their perceptions about it, you need to ask them. So you have to make data collection methods that will get at that, um, these, these questions about their feelings and their thoughts about something versus a question that's more about their learning. If your question is, does um, use of chat GPT um, improve my students' writing, then you need to gather samples of their writing. Um, you can also ask them, do you think chat GPT helped you to improve your writing? But that is different from knowing if it did. So my perception, my self-report, 
my perception of my improvement is not the same as actual improvement in writing. Um, so it's, it's kind of important to think about those things. Um, yeah, you can also um, enlist students in helping to gather data. So talking to students about research and saying, okay, this class is going to investigate what are the best ways to improve our writing using digital tools and resources. So everyone in the class has to help gather some evidence of this. And often by talking to students about it and turning it over to them, they can decide what evidence to share with you. So they may be able to reflect on their own work and say, here's my piece of evidence that best shows my improvement. And I do see a lot of connections with PBLA here, um, but we do that for different purposes. That's for assessment purposes. This is for um, improving instruction. Very great examples indeed, Saskia. Thank you so much. Um, very good. Anyone who could share their opinions? Uh, if I may, and maybe the data collection tools or methods uh, may be governed also by uh, who is involved in the research. Is it collaborative versus uh, an instructor uh, only based? So I'm doing my, my action research within my classroom versus me and my colleagues are doing the same thing. And collaboratively, we can use uh, maybe mixed methods uh, and uh, analyze multiple multi uh are tracked as uh, suspect is. Um, and again, we are governed by the time, especially post work that needs to be finished, grading needs to be finished. So we need to, to be also pragmatic and uh, realistic about uh, how much we can accomplish within the defined uh, outline or the plan that we want to, to work in Quebec. Great, and, and Saskia touched on time, right? She mentioned that, well, we need to really make good use of our time um, and, and what we can accomplish during this period of time, as Mahmoud was saying as well. And I would say that maybe um, a, a tool I've used, um, a technique I've used is instead of interviewing one student at a time, I would organize a focus group discussion and interview five students at a time, invite all five of them, and then have a focus group discussion so that they could share their opinions and reflections and any examples as well from their own learning. So that could be a, a one way of, of using your time wisely, right? Or for instance, what I always do in my course, I always ask them to share a reflection paper where they reflect on three things they learned and three things they would like to learn or three things they need to improve. So whatever my focus is, right, on the course. So there could be various ways, right? And Saskia really shared uh, some great techniques with us that that can be used. Um, mm -hmm. Is there, um, I don't know if this is a fair question or not, but could you like recommend like sort of a student uh, starter kit of of investigation tools that like if we were interested in doing this we're not sure we're taking baby steps we don't want to get ourselves over is there like three or four um investigative tools that you would recommend that we might pursue um i think it's great to take some things you're already doing and see them as data collection methods so um nana has a really great suggestion that fits um, any student reflections, or like Loretta said, um, the reflection papers, student self-assessments, those would be data. So looking at things you are already collecting from students and just seeing them not just as assessment um, artifacts, but as research artifacts. And I guess where the difference lies is when we are say, assessing a piece of student writing, we're making a judgment, we're making an evaluation. Um, when we are observing a piece of student writing and gathering inferences from it, when we're evaluating it's what it's telling us, 
but not to give it a grade, but to look at it as what can I learn as, as a researcher, as a teacher researcher, by looking at what my students have done, then um, you take the, the evaluative lens off and you really are just describing what you see. So I, I would say for the perceptual pieces, student teacher conferences, you can record them uh, using Zoom and generate automatic transcriptions. You can use this piece of software called Otter AI, which does really nice transcripts from any kind of audio file. Um, and quizzes to students about their learning. Um, so I would say maybe a good starting place for teachers might be looking at that, that student perception. I, th I think that's that's easy around the reflection pieces, quizzes, student self reports, and things like that. It's a little bit, you know, when you're looking at the artifacts of learning to see how they've learned or how they've improved. Um, if you know exactly what you're looking for, like how can I best teach my students to um, write an argumentative piece or a persuasive piece of writing, then, you know, you would gather a persuasive piece of writing in advance that they have done. And then you, you could do your intervention to try to teach them persuasive writing and then get them to do another piece of persuasive writing and gather both of those pieces of writing and then compare them and see how they're different. So in that case, you would, you would turn to samples of student work or any assessment great no that's a that's some really helpful advice that we can take in and use right away so thank you great thank you thank you so much um these are great ideas i'm sure everybody's taking down notes and is thinking about their own classrooms and how we can apply this because um the most important thing we need to think about is our next question, which is how can conducting research support our own teaching? Elizabeth, our next question, how can this research help us with our own teaching and learning? Because that's the final goal. Um, so as teachers in our classroom, we want to conduct research and see the value of it in supporting our learners and of course, in supporting ourselves. Saskia, any ideas here? Yes, there, there are a few ways to regard this. Number one, what is professional learning? What does it mean to get better at what we do as educators? You know, we can attend workshops, but when we attend workshops, even like, you know, our workshop right now, it's, it's great if, you, if you're here and you remember everything, but three weeks from now, you might not remember everything. But if you engage in this kind of inquiry in your classroom, it's very sustained. It's not a one and done. It's gonna take days, weeks, maybe a couple months. So the learning that you will derive from that will be really powerful. So it will make you a reflective practitioner by, by its very nature. Engaging in research inquiry, you have to become a reflective re teacher, practitioner. Um, also, Professional learning is more lasting when we've done it in a sustained way, when we've done it in an ongoing way. And going back to what Mahmoud said earlier, this is why when I was the ESL coordinator, we did some um, collaborative inquiry sessions. We did some around writing. I think we did some around engagement. I can't even remember anymore. But the point was to, to do it over time because it better helps professional learning. And... Of course, when we are doing this work of observing, gathering evidence, interpreting evidence, we are also enhancing our professional judgment. Professional judgment is key to becoming uh, a better teacher. Um, and as we know, these things grow over the course of your career. You get better and better at them as time goes by. 
Um, and then it also improves teaching and learning because then you try something new the next time. So you iterate, you, you make improvements and that's good for your students. Another, just a, a last piece around this is that hopefully, and I would, it would make me incredibly delighted to know that if some of you try this over the months ahead, if you would share how it went at the next Tesla Ontario conference. So a good thing to do when you engage in research is to disseminate that research after. Because if we just share knowledge with ourselves, that's great. It's even better if we share it with our colleagues. So writing an article for the contact magazine, doing a conference presentation, doing a presentation for colleagues at your own institution, doing a presentation for uh, parents, for community members, um, you know, share your learning because it's validating for you as an educator. Uh, it helps you participate in your community of practice. You can involve your students in sharing the work. I love to, to involve my, my students or collaborating teachers in doing presentations with me. It's more fun. Um, and yeah, so I'd say these are the ways in which it improves teaching and learning for me. And, and I think that's borne out by, by the scholarship around action research as well. Inspiring indeed. So I really hope, uh, well, you talk about our session tonight with your fellow colleagues as well, right? You talk with them about what we learned and what we discussed together so that um, we motivate ourselves, but also others to be actively engaged in our own teaching and learning. Great ideas, Saskia, amazing. Um, so Mahmoud is sharing that learning comes from the process rather than the outcome, right? It's a reflection piece that's really crucial and then taking action and planning and continuing the, the cycle, Saskia mentioned. So it's, it is a process indeed. Um, and Mahmoud is saying that a trick he learned while detecting if students have used ChatGPT to produce their assignment, we can use ChatGPT to analyze the text discourse analysis, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, there are so many ways we can use mm, ChatGPT and learn together, right? Use it as a tool to improve our learning um, for sure. Okay, very good. Any questions or comments before we move to our breakout room activity? Anything you'd like to share with us? Okay. Yes. Okay. So that means we're ready for our breakout room activity. Um, so Elizabeth, so yeah, yes. so we're going to put you in groups, um, and mm -hmm. we would like you to first off get a, a spokesperson for your group, so somebody who will report back to us after your discussions are over. Uh, we'll give you time. Uh, how long have we decided, Loretta? 10 minutes, 15? So about 10 minutes will be more minutes. than enough. And the question we have is, would you like to engage in research in your classroom? So that's... Uh, that's our question to you. Take your time to discuss it with one another. Um, if you feel you're motivated, inspired enough to um, start, engage yourself in research in your own classrooms um, or collaborate with others in research as well. So that's the question we have for you tonight. Uh, spend 10, maybe 12 minutes and discuss with one another. Please pick a spokesperson so that when we come back in the big room, you can share your ideas and the feedback you got from one another. Okay, welcome back everyone. Uh, we hope you had a great time inside your uh, breakout rooms. Uh, now is the time where we'd like to get uh, somebody to report uh, on what happened inside your uh, your room. So let's start with room one. That's uh, Aaron, Alarando, and Alarandra, Jinping, and uh, Nina. Somebody from that group would like to speak? I think we have everybody in now. So if you could. Yeah. Okay, so so we'll get report from a spokesperson for each uh, of the, the rooms. 
So group one, uh, Aaron, uh, Alaryanda, Jinping, and uh, Nana. Somebody from that group like to speak? Tell us what you discussed in the class. Uh, sure, I'm the spokesperson, so. Okay, go ahead, Aaron. Uh, so one of our members was actually doing some research uh, for her um, master's, and it was just kind of about um, student teachers and how they feel about books and if they're useful or if they're any good, but uh, she's still in the process. We also discussed that PL, uh, PBLA binders, because two of us were, were in link, um, they're a good source of evidence uh, and they're a good source of collecting data. And also collecting the data would be kind of an everyday process. Uh, you might do a little bit every day with activities and reflections. That's that's mostly what we talked about. And we had like kind of a little bit of an interest in, in doing research. Okay. So some interest uh, reflected. Okay. So room number two. Alia, uh, Audrey, Elizabeth, uh, Marwa, Shauna. Anybody from that group like to be the spokesperson? Room two. Oh, Shauna, do you want to speak? All right. <laughs> <laughs> I could. Um, okay, go ahead. Do. No, 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 do. go ahead. I don't. I'm not quite sure what to. Somebody, uh, go on. Go ahead, right. Audrey. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Um, well, uh, none of us really had a lot of experience, except for Shauna, in uh, research in the classroom. Um, Shauna's doing her, uh, going to be working on her PhD, so she in EAP, and so she was explaining what how she was going to be looking into sustainable uh, uh, supports in education in uh, in a university setting. And then uh, we discussed some other ideas, like uh, a couple of us teach literacy. And I had noticed that um, uh, the students, when I was teaching ordinal numbers and talking about when each person came into class, like so-and-so was first and another was second and third, all of a sudden they started showing up to class faster. And I thought, <laughs> well, maybe there could be research around competitiveness. And uh, and then I was seeing uh, um, a participant action uh, email recently about newcomers doing exercise. And I thought, well, that might be an interest because we don't have that in our school setting, um, like the way you do in high school, like sports and stuff. And maybe it would be interesting to do an exercise, exercise with the students and see through research if um, their skills improve in English and all that kind of thing. So okay, okay. that's kind of what we discussed. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, so let's move on to group three. Um, Amandeep, uh, Mira, Jessica, Mirvat, uh, Natalie, somebody from that group like to speak for us. Um, I guess, uh, yeah, um, I'm always, I, I feel sometimes like I yank the microphone, but um, yeah, we, I mean, everybody, um, their first answer was yes. Um, we'd like to engage in uh, research. Um, only one of us has um, experience, experience already. Um, so Natalie, um, uh, did um, collaborate with a colleague in in the colleague's classroom um, and her research question or interest was how uh, personalizing learning increases learner engagement, um, which sounds really interesting. Um, but yeah, it basically our discussion um, uh, inspired a lot of questions um, about how, you know, and thinking, you know, it's the, the yes, but, right? Yes, but, you know, how do I find the time? Um, how do I carve out the time in a very busy prescriptive curriculum, right? Um, uh, because we, we were talking about the AI, you know, um, 
the question about AI and how um, uh, uh, Amira was was talking about that in her classroom and thinking, wow, I would really like to look at how I can use AI, right? Or uh, to Im improve my students writing or that sort of thing. And, um, you know, but how can she find the time? Um, yeah, so yeah, lots of questions. Um, and maybe I'll stop there and bring them up later. <laughs> okay. But yeah. All right. Thank you for your report. All right. So let's move on to uh, room four. Um, Hedai Yesadat, Jennifer, Marta, and Mohammed. Somebody from that room like to speak just briefly because we're getting short on time. Hi, uh, it's Jennifer. Wow. Very quickly for our group, we had a, a really interesting group of people we all said yes that you know we'd like to do research um the group was you know included people that are new to teaching and people with decades of experience what we shared was that we're uh, in addition to interest in research we're all challenged with time um you know uh, not just the teaching uh requirements in terms of time but also other activities to support teaching the administration some of us are in the college uh, environment. So um, a possible way to overcome that challenge we found was possibly trying to integrate the research activities in with activities we're already conducting, you know, slight modifications of some of our testing. And that, you know, one of the key things, and I'll end on this, is that um, we found that research has the potential to really help inform our teaching and make us better teachers because we're not just, focusing on the teaching itself, but observing ourselves and, and what we're doing in the classroom. And that's about it. All right, thank you for sharing. Uh, so that's uh, room five now. So uh, Barana, um, Dominica, Haley, and Mahmoud. Somebody from that group like to speak? My name's Haley. Um, so I'm actually a TESOL student and so was one of the other group mates in my group. Um, and one was a new uh, teacher. She, I think she's been teaching for about a year. So all of us said we'd love to, but maybe later in our careers. And at this point, uh, Mahmoud uh, reminded us that we're kind of doing a lot of self-reflection and that's kind of our action research right now um, and trying to be the best teachers we can. But once we get to know our own classrooms and our own students, we would be really interested in doing some more action research. Good, good perspective on that. Uh, so that's, uh, we're on to room six now. And just quickly from either uh, Shanai, uh, Daryl, uh, Yabo, or Yusra. Somebody from that group like to give us just a quick summary of what you guys talked about? Um, is Yusra there? Or? Oh, yes, I'm here. I'm okay. Would you like me to go? Okay. So we basically, uh, well, we all said yes, and we we thought that this, well, stepping into a classroom-based research would help us add new dimensions, and we could, you know, uh, we often and um, Darley mentioned something, uh, we often don't know how much we know, and, you know, the more we discover, actually, we also discover our ignorance as well. I think it's a bit a bit philosophic, but in, in 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 a classroom, so we can get to know our students more when we are engaged in such research. And well, I think that was the point. But we were more focusing on discovering new things and adding new dimensions in our teaching and approach. Let's say. Great. Great. Well, thanks for your input. That was really good. So I'm going to throw it back to Loretta now. for the close. Thank you, everyone. That was amazing. We got lots of yeses, Saskia. So there's lots of work ahead. And I really hope that you get a chance to start working. And if you want to connect with Saskia, uh, here is her contact detail. Um, her address at York University is right here for you to take a picture of or contact her as well thank you thank you so much for staying four minutes five minutes longer as well um it's 8 34 now and um we cannot be 
more than thankful to Saskia for presenting for us tonight and to all of you for sharing your expertise, your experience, your questions, your interest in the topic. So thank you. Thank you so much, Saskia. Thank you, Elizabeth, David, for supporting um, each other tonight. And thank you to each and every one of our members for investing in their own professional development, investing in their own um, profession, and to our student teachers as well, who were here tonight. Thank you so much and see you in other events, everybody. Mm -hmm.